the anime begins with a big ass battle between the demon army and a besieged human city. Here, we are introduced to the protagonist, Ike, the commander of the Undead Brigade. Using his powerful magic, Ike destroys the city's walls, allowing his troops to enter. His servant, Jiren, informs him that the orcs have been given a battering ram as per his orders. We see that Ike's army is easily crushing the human enemies, creating total chaos. Ike suddenly appears inside the castle, confronting the leader of the knights. The knight, calm and composed, assumes from Ike's appearance that he is the enemy leader. Ike introduces himself as the commander of the 7th Undead Brigade of the Dark Lord's army. He then explains the knight has three choices, surrender and hand over his lands, take his own life if he still has any honor, or flee while Ike admires the view from the window. The knight mocks the idea of a demon showing mercy but is displeased with the options given. Without further words, he attacks Ike, who incapacitates him mid-air with a powerful spell. Seconds later, Ike orders Jiren to treat the knight's wounds and those of the soldiers who surrendered. We see Ike being observed by a woman from the Dark Lord's army, who remarks that capturing Aranam with just one brigade in a week proves Ike's potential. Thanks to him, they could conquer the city. Back with Ike, he casts a magical barrier over the entire room for privacy. He reflects on all that has happened. The battle is over, and he would be lying if he said he didn't feel guilty for hurting so many people. He can never get used to the blood and horror of war, because he is a human, not a demon. His master, Romberg, was a great mage who knew everything about the advanced civilization that once inhabited the world. Romberg adopted and raised Ike despite him being human, teaching him all he knew, including magic. Romberg's final words were never to speak of the lost civilization, as it would one day bring catastrophe. He also instructed Ike never to remove his robe or mask, as the Dark Lord would never forgive him if his identity were discovered. And what was he thinking? That a powerful barrier surrounds this room, and without his permission, no one can enter? Oh, that's what he thought until he noticed a maid hiding under the desk. She was scared when he saw her and begged him not to kill her. But before she could say more, she hit her head on the desk as she stood up, injuring herself so badly that she fell unconscious, crying. Ike thought that he should be the one crying, as his secret had been discovered so easily after 20 years of hiding it. Minutes later, Ike went out to talk with his servant, who reported that they had successfully captured the castle. The servant questioned if Ike was letting too many humans live. He assured Ike not to worry because, unlike his predecessor, the current Dark Lord only cares about results. The servant mentioned that other leaders wanted to kill the people and burn the city. Ike responded by pointing out that if they killed everyone, there would be no one left to pay taxes, and since Arsenam is a commercial city, there would be no one to manage the businesses. At that moment, they were interrupted by a group of humans who boldly stood before them. Despite their audacity, Ike allowed them to speak. One of them asked how much tax they would have to pay. Ike replied that they would continue to pay the same as before, which made them all happy. However, he also warned them that anyone who resisted the army, regardless of who they were, would be punished. Suddenly, Ike was teleported to a dark place where a golem began attacking him. He dodged its attacks carefully, reminding his commander that he had promised not to teleport him without warning, as he was already used to her doing this. With no other choice, he summoned his staff and cast a cutting spell that easily shattered the golem into pieces. After that, she appeared before him, mentioning that she had a lot of confidence in the golem she had created. She was Sephiro, the commander of the 7th Brigade of the Army, Ike's superior and the only demon who knew his secret. This meant that Ike was not actually the commander but an officer. He asked her to send a messenger next time. But Sephiro disagreed, saying that would be boring. She also informed him that she had learned everything that had happened in Arsenom thanks to her familiar, including how he took the city and what he did afterward. She summoned him because Darrow Cuton wanted to see him in person, and it might be the first time an officer received such an honor. She thought that Darrow had probably chosen Ike because he was impressed by how he took Arsenom in a week. So, she tells Ike that she'll take him to the Dark Lord's castle. There, she asks Ike to place his hand on her shoulder, but she feels a bit disappointed when he doesn't take the opportunity to touch her breasts. Ike says he would never do that, making Sephiro laugh before teleporting them both to the demon castle. In a change of scene, we return to the maid who had fainted earlier. She wakes up and realizes there's an invisible wall preventing her from leaving. Seconds later, she notices a plate of food on the table with a note instructing her to eat and not move from that spot. As she approaches to read it, she can't understand the strange writing. But she tries the food anyway and is surprised by how delicious it is. Without hesitation, she jumps on the table and eats everything. 
near the demon castle. Sephiro asks Ike if the miasma is affecting him, which wouldn't be surprising since he is human. As they approach the entrance, Ike asks if the guardian mage checks everyone entering the castle. She confirms this, saying no one can see the Dark Lord without being inspected. Ike worries that his identity might be discovered and that they will likely remove his mask and robe. Sephiro assures him not to worry and discreetly casts a light magic that wraps around him. When the mage sees it, he praises the splendid magic surrounding Ike, as expected from Romerg's grandson. Ike asks if he knew his grandfather, to which the mage replies that all demons know the name of the master mage. This surprises Ike, as Romberg's fame persists even after his death. With no difficulties at the entrance, they proceed. Ike thinks about how Dor Berber, the enormous Dark Lord's castle, was built to showcase his power and magic, which is why it has unnecessarily long corridors. He also complains that Sephiro can fly during the journey, as he has always wanted her flight spell. Although he can use the spell, he doesn't control it as well as she does, and the best he can do is jump high, which he used to dodge the golem's attacks. When they reach the door to the royal chamber, Sephiro instructs him to wait outside while she speaks first. Here, Ike recalls who Darrow Cuton, the current Dark Lord, is. He turned the tide of the war against humanity and gave the demons an advantage with just one battle. He is the leader of the demons and their strongest warrior, known for being cruel and cold, killing anyone he deems useless, friend or foe. However, if he finds value in someone, he will make good use of them, regardless of their lack of magic or strength, judging solely on their skill and ability. That's why he revolutionized the army. Demons are born reluctant to work with others, constantly fighting among themselves, but Darrow Cuton changed everything. Minutes later, Sephiro allows Ike to enter, where he finally meets the Dark Lord. Realizing it's a girl, Darrow Cuton brings up the conquest of Arsenam, to which Ike responds that he was just following orders and that all the credit should go to Sephiro. Hearing this, Darrow Cuton comments on his humility, noting that he acts just like a human which worries Ike as his humility might reveal his true nature. Sephiro takes the opportunity to inform the Dark Lord that Ike is the grandson of Romerg, known as the Guardian of Hell. Upon hearing this, Darrow Cuton understands why Ike is humble. Recognizing that he likely reflects deeply and didn't kill anyone or execute their leader, thus conquering Arsenom with minimal injuries. Ike realizes he should have listened to Jiren, who advised him to act like a demon and publicly execute the leader, but he corrects himself knowing he could never do that because he is human. Ike asks the Dark Lord for permission to speak, and she grants it. He explains that while humans may be fearful, they won't obey out of fear alone. He compares the productivity of cities with executed leaders to those where leaders remained, showing that the latter is better for the demon army. She asks if Romberg shared this view, and Ike confirms it. Ike begins to think about Darrow Cuton, who he believes knows about the lost civilization just like Romberg and used that knowledge to revolutionize the army. Suddenly, Darrow Cuton teleports in front of him, commenting that he is different from other demons and that next time she wants to see the face behind the mask. She expects him to continue achieving good results and work hard. After she leaves, Ike removes his mask to breathe better, having felt immense pressure. He tells Sephiro that despite his actions, he is a coward. She responds by saying he should be grateful she didn't reveal he is human, and that he has received a reward, though he sees it more as a punishment. Ike then returns to the maid he had left confined. He wakes her up, causing her to panic from fear. He manages to calm her down and asks her name. She says it's Sadie, which he finds unusual. She explains that slaves are named after numbers, and her mother was called Sati. Ike tells her that now that she knows he's human, he can't let her go. But since he understands she won't reveal his secret, he asks her to be his maid from now on. The maid quickly accepts, hugging him happily, leading to a mutual agreement. Later, Ike meets with his army where Jiren congratulates him on becoming the governor of Avalias. This is followed by a flashback to the conversation he had with Sephiro, who informed him about this reward. Ike is confused and asks why Avalias. She explains that it is further south than Arsenom, and now at the war front. It is a small but vital city for the army, and his mission will be to protect it and collect double the taxes. If he disagrees, he can ask for triple. Currently, Ike complains that his commander doesn't consider the aftermath of the battle, as her use of magic is always very destructive. He is upset because Avalias is in ruins and there's much work to be done. He tells Jiren that they will first rebuild the walls. Jiren informs him that it will probably take about six months to complete this task. Ike thinks that's too long and considers leaving it, but after some thought, he tells Jiren they will complete it in one month, using not only humans but demons as well. 
The demons and humans start working together, which surprises Jiren. He sees his lord as a box of surprises because he has never seen anything like this. Ike divided the workers into eight-hour shifts so they could work around the clock and even paid them to boost their morale. Jiren now understands that his lord is a genius and why he is the most brilliant in the army. He even begins to think that leaving Ike would be a mistake, as he is sure Ike will become the next Dark Lord. Continuing with our story, we see that the demons gradually encountered more humans who joined forces to fight them. Unfortunately for the humans, even united, they couldn't stop the demons from the massacre they were about to commit, thanks to the demons' mage allies. However, these alliances were still a threat to Lady Darrowcutan. She had the perfect person in mind to face this new danger, Ike, who was in his office. He now had a new maid, who handed him a cup of tea with a smile. We also see more humans, where a knight named Alistar is called by her superior to recapture the city of Ibelis at all costs. They couldn't allow another enemy city to take it. With this mission in mind, the soldier bravely accepted to fight for her city. Nearby, there was a simple game where you had to guess under which cup a small ball was hidden. The prize was double the amount bet. A maid named Sati was convinced she would win and wanted to play, but she had no money, which annoyed the man running the game as it wasted his time. Seeing this, he suggested she could pay him in other ways if she didn't have cash. Once all bets were placed, the cups began to float magically, revealing there was no ball underneath any of them. The maid, embarrassed, explained that the city was full of distractions, making it impossible not to get sidetracked. Ike continued his mission to spy on the city, confirming that humans were forming strong alliances. He saw the large number of soldiers being sent to fight and concluded that this could only mean one thing, the Great Alliance of Kings. The maid, said he, didn't understand what this meant, so Ike explained it was an ancient alliance that rarely happened. When it did, neighboring countries would forget their differences and unite to face a common enemy. This worried Sati, fearing it could be dangerous for her lord. Ike agreed, noting that this was the third time humans had formed such an alliance. The last two times, the humans easily defeated the demons, forcing the survivors to hide in Dover Castle for years. This scared Sati, knowing it could mean their end, and Ike was surprised by her concern. At the end of the day, she was human. If the humans won, nothing bad would happen to her. However, she had another reality, she knew she was the daughter of a slave. Even if humanity won, she would still be a slave in this sad and ugly society. In other words, she would end up just like the orphan children in the city. Understanding this, Ike wanted to reassure her, telling her that the current Dark Lord was the strongest and wisest in all of history. Despite this, he knew that both races had significant problems beyond the war and wondered how to solve them. Suddenly, they were interrupted by the same swindler from before. He was looking for Sati to demand compensation for ruining his business, asking for money in her body in payment for the trouble she caused. Luckily, no one was watching. Ike decided to use his powers to freeze the thug's feet and then create sharp crystals to threaten him. He wanted to know what the army was doing in the area. Though the swindler hesitated, fear made him reveal that the army was there because of the king's alliance, formed to fight the demons in the war. He also mentioned that the Rosaria army had hidden plans to attack the Dark Lord by surprise before the entire king's alliance could, aiming to take all the glory for their country. This glory had many advantages, such as gaining influence in strategic councils by recovering cities, making the city very influential in the war. However, this was a double-edged sword. If they failed, the kingdom of Rosaria would be left exposed and defenseless. According to the swindler, the only way to attack was through Ibelis. Although it was a relatively new city, its gate was damaged, and it wasn't known for having many defenses, making it the best city to pass through. With all this information, Ike and Sati withdrew, leaving the thug to his fate. Returning to his office to finish writing all the reports, Ike found a demoness who had been searching for him for days. It was Lilith, one of Ike's servants, who hadn't been informed that her master now ran a city and had another servant by his side. Sati kindly introduced herself as Ike's new caretaker, but Lilith didn't like her at all. She called Sati an ugly human and demanded that her master throw her out, insisting that she was a much better option. Containing her anger, Sati asked Lilith to stay away from their master, as he needed to rest after so much work. This inevitably led to a fight between them, with Lilith jealous and Sati offended. Outside the neighboring kingdom, cities were preparing for a major, almost suicidal attack against the demons. Before entering the kingdom of Ibelis, some soldiers were surprised to find the once-destroyed gate now completely repaired. With no other options, they prepared to force it open. However, before they could fire, a group of skeletons emerged from the ground without any apparent reason. Their new mission became protecting the gunners at all costs since the skeletons were no match for them. Suddenly, an arrow struck one of the soldiers, revealing that another race had set a trap for them. Ogres began attacking the soldiers before they could react, forcing the knight Alistar to order an immediate retreat. As they fled, Ike noticed that the enemy's armor belonged to the Order of the Galrosha. A messenger thanked him for his master's incredible foresight in predicting the attack. At that moment, a friendly arrow surprised Ike, and suddenly it was night. The captain of the Galrosha was furious because the surprise attack had brought only shame to the kingdom. 
He harshly demanded that the battalion captain be imprisoned as punishment. The military corporal knew this was a bad idea since she was an incredible soldier and her imprisonment could demoralize the other soldiers, but the captain didn't care, as he had no idea how to face the king after such an embarrassing defeat. After the attack, Ike woke up in a room with Sapphiro by his side. The young man immediately demanded an explanation. But his superior didn't understand why Ike was now so angry when, the night before, he had held her so tightly. This only confused the young man more. Finally, his superior explained that she had only been taking care of him after an arrow had struck him while he was caught off guard. Although Ike was very grateful, Sapphiro knew things were not all good. In their last battle, there hadn't been many enemy casualties, which could make the Dark Lord suspicious. It seemed the Dark Lord was very committed to finding a world where humans and demons could live in peace. Sapphiro accepted this but reminded Ike that he wasn't fully healed and needed to rest before teleporting away, leaving Ike alone. As he examined the arrow that had injured him, he wondered who could have shot it. Nearby, Lilith continued to pretend, while Sati was also there, wanting to check if her master had recovered. This, as always, caused more problems between the two. The wise messenger knew how to end the conflict, so he took one of them out of the room since their master wanted to ask a small favor. Specifically, Ike wanted to know where the woman they had seen fleeing in white armor was. The next day, while walking in the forest, the messenger shared the information he had obtained. Commander Alistar was in prison for retreating from combat. Lilith was unhappy that her master had decided to go in person to a human city since humans tend to be very violent. However, Ike knew he had to go personally if he wanted better results. He asked the demoness to leave, but Lilith refused, believing that a pretty girl on the mission would bring good luck and wanting some time with him like Sati. With no other options, Lilith was accepted into the mission. Upon arriving near the prison, they saw that it wasn't very well guarded. Though it would be easy to defeat the guards, Ike didn't want to cause any commotion. He began to think of a plan to get in quickly and unnoticed. However, before he could finalize his plan, Lilith had already silently taken care of all the guards, as her master wished. Upon entering, they saw the place was enormous, and finding the captain could take hours. Sapphiro hit a guard and forced him to reveal where the captain was, reducing their search time to a minimum. They only needed to go to the top floor. More guards appeared, as Lilith's silent plan hadn't been entirely quiet, but she held them off, giving her master enough time to find and speak with the captain. Reaching the top floor, Ike used a key to enter, but finding no one, he thought he had made a mistake. Suddenly, someone almost stabbed him from behind, but a well-placed punch resolved the issue. The attacker was a young blonde woman, Alistar, who assumed a demon had come to mock her defeat. Ike only wanted to ask her about their last battle, specifically if the commander had sent an assassin to attack him with arrows. Before answering, Alistar wanted to know if she was truly speaking to a demon. This intrigued Ike, but as the guards seemed to have discovered him, his question had to be answered immediately. The squadron captain simply wanted to know what a human pretending to be a demon was doing in her cell. Immediately, a group of guards rushed toward our protagonist, who had little time to react. The general demanded to know why he was acting like a human despite being a demon. As the delay continued, another guard arrived just in time to imprison Ike. With no other options, Ike used a temporal spell that dulled all human senses, rendering the threats from the young woman and the guards ineffective, as no one could move. To ensure they wouldn't interfere further, Ike summoned a strong wind that swept the guards away, unaware that another guard had sneaked up behind him. This guard missed his only chance to win the fight, and Ike, sensing no further danger, invoked his dark footprints, a spell that manipulated the area's gravity. The pressure was so intense that neither the knight nor the metal bridge holding him could withstand it. Although the knight would likely die, something softened his fall, which Ike was responsible for. Knight Alistar noticed this and wondered why Ike had saved him, even though the gravity spell had broken the ground beneath her as well. Despite her questions, the young woman first asked for Ike's name. Humbly, he introduced himself as Ike, the supreme commander of the 7th Brigade of the Undead, surprising the knight, as someone of such rank wouldn't typically save an enemy. Ike then recalled her earlier question about whether he was human, which he denied, stating that a human couldn't be part of the Great Dark Lord's army. With everything said, Ike asked if she had secretly ordered someone to kill him during their last encounter. After a moment of silence, she refused to answer, affirming that she was a knight loyal to her kingdom and would never share such information with a demon. She demanded his death, and seeing her resolve, Ike cornered her. Ike decided to use one of his mind-reading spells, which activated just in time as the young knight was cornering him, making the situation quite uncomfortable. Lilith, noticing this, quickly asked her lord why he was making her do such things, even those that seemed more filthy. Once the mind reading was complete, Ike saw no reason to stay in the cell, so he left. This departure confused the captain, who demanded to know why the demons were leaving, as she hadn't given them an answer. Ike responded truthfully, stating that he already had the answer because he read her mind with one of his spells. He also mentioned that she was innocent and had no orders to go after him. Although she was his enemy, Ike offered her some advice, not to bow her head after a defeat, as what matters is what one does after a great loss. With nothing else to do, Ike decided it was time to go home. 
He ignored the worldly desires Lilith had in mind and opened a large space-time portal. Upon arriving home, he found Sati, to whom he had brought a gift, rice. Although Sati had never prepared rice before, Ike assured her it was delicious. He also reminded her that the city's taxes would soon double. As an agricultural city with fertile lands, wheat was abundant, though rice was no longer the top crop in terms of productivity. This information overwhelmed Sati, who, being a slave, had little education. I kindly explained that rice grew faster and required less labor, allowing people to dedicate themselves to other tasks like making tools, weapons, or bricks for the city. This explanation helped Sati understand Ike's plan better, as these services would benefit the city. Ike emphasized that a prosperous country relies on having experts in various fields. Despite the lengthy explanation, Sati requested a simpler summary. Ike assured her that they would eat well and have more diverse constructions if his plan succeeded, which made Sati very happy. However, Sati didn't know how to cook rice, as she had never prepared it before. Ike couldn't help either, as he had never cooked it himself. This task was entrusted to Sati, who, despite feeling nervous and afraid of making mistakes, received a small clue from Ike. She had heard a saying in the city, first boil, then simmer, and don't lift the lid even if a baby cries. With this little information, Sati assured Ike she would do her best. While Ike left with his messenger, who had the entire army ready to hear his words, he took a moment to consider who might have betrayed him. He remembered that the arrow must have come from the enemy army, but after speaking with the enemy captain, he doubted this theory. This left only one conclusion, the attacker wanted to frame the White Rose army, knowing they would be quickly blamed. The idea of a traitor in his ranks was painful for Ike, but he had no choice but to investigate. Using a mind-reading spell in the area, he started by reading the mind of his messenger, who was only thinking about how great Ike was, so he was quickly ruled out. The remaining minds were those of his supposed loyal soldiers, most of whom were innocent. However, Ike found a suspicious small goblin and directly asked if he was the spy. The scene then shifted to later that night when Ike went to visit Sapphiro. She was taking a bath, so Ike respectfully waited outside. When she asked if he had found a traitor in his ranks, Ike's attention was piqued, and he quickly revealed that the second in command of his 7th battalion, a one-eyed goblin named Jace, had betrayed him. This did not surprise Sapphiro, who had always suspected Jace. Ike, feeling depressed, lamented that Jace was both intelligent and an experienced warrior, making his betrayal even harder to handle. This was why he sought Sapphiro's advice. Sapphiro rose from the bath, catching Ike off guard. Like a true gentleman, he immediately turned away. She then advised him to make Jace pay for daring to betray his superior. The next day, Ike and his forces moved towards the kingdom, bringing the goblin Jace to face justice. Jace was informed that Ike had visited the commander in the middle of the night, but Jace was more surprised at how quickly his superior had recovered from the arrow attack. Jace, the one who had actually attacked Ike, was puzzled by Ike's recovery. At the same time, another informant told Jace that they had lost contact with the spy they had planted in Ike's army, which was unusual. The situation worsened when Ike himself visited Jace. Jace wanted to know why his great lord had come, and Ike casually claimed he was just in the neighborhood. However, Jace noticed that Ike was accompanied by a large army. Jace questioned how someone as skilled as Ike had been wounded in his last battle, considering Ike was a great commander who shouldn't fall into such traps. Ike, not in the mood for jokes, revealed that he had discovered Jace was the traitor. Despite this revelation, Jace remained confident because he had too many soldiers for Ike to handle alone. However, Jace's confidence was misplaced, as meteorites began to rain from the sky, destroying his entire territory. This was the work of Sapphiro, who mercilessly obliterated everything in her path as retribution for the betrayal. Jace remembered asking his superior to minimize the damage, a request that Sapphiro seemed to have forgotten in her vengeful fury. As Sapphiro exacted her revenge, the undead forces completed the task, ensuring that the price of betrayal was paid in full. When Jace's turn came, he was fortunate to have many elves on his side, who went all out against Ike. Ike quickly sensed the ambush, but this distraction allowed Jace enough time to flee across the rooftops. An ogre titan even appeared to stall Ike, but with a black homunculus and a portal, Jace managed to escape the area. However, this wasn't enough to shake off Ike, who had cleverly placed a tracking demon on Jace's clothes. This allowed Ike to follow Jace closely. Left with no other choice, Jace attempted to defeat Ike, but Ike's defense was too strong. Using a branch spell, Ike ended the fight. Facing defeat, Jace proposed an alliance to Ike, suggesting they overthrow the entire army of the Dark Lord. Ike, of course, rejected the offer. Jace, unwilling to give up, tried to attack Ike again, but Ike dodged the assault. At that moment, Sapphiro found them and declared she would be in charge of the interrogation. To everyone's surprise, a poison began to take effect on Jace. Although Ike tried to heal him, the poison did not dissipate, indicating that Jace had been poisoned before he could reveal any information. Sapphiro, realizing that their own people had betrayed them, demanded the names of the culprits. Jace, on the brink of death, whispered the names, but the plot left this detail unrevealed. Later, both Sapphiro and Ike were summoned by the Dark Lord, who suspected that the leader of the 3rd Battalion, Bastion, was behind the betrayal. Sapphiro wanted to administer the punishment herself, 
but Darrowcuton, a council member, demanded proof of the accusation. Sapphiro recounted the events and how they had to eliminate Jace. The Dark Lady, also present, wanted to hear Bastion's side of the story. The soldier quickly claimed he was completely innocent of the accusations against him, blaming Ike and Sapphiro for betraying their sub-commander. He said he was only blamed for weakening the army from within. Sapphiro didn't like these words, especially when Bastio said it wasn't safe to have a witch in their ranks, which only fueled the tension between the commanders. But this was not the place to fight, especially with the Dark Lord present. The Dark Lord knew demons had a weakness for power, and when they got it, they wanted more riches, glory, influence, and more. He understood why, but he also knew that if he didn't stop these feelings, he'd end up without soldiers to fight for him. So, Darrowcuton quickly accused Bastio of lying, saying she always knew he was guilty, while Sapphiro told the truth. However, according to the Dark Lord, she had a weakness because her men were not fully loyal to her. Knowing the right thing was to punish both for their mistakes, the Dark Lord decided to minimize losses by having a duel to the death between them. The winner would receive complete forgiveness. But the duel wouldn't happen immediately as Sapphiro returned home, uneasy because the rules required fighting with magical creatures called puppets. Each commander had to present a team of 50 puppets, and no direct help from the commanders was allowed. The winner would destroy all the enemy's puppets, and the loser would lose their life. This seemed strange since they could just have a simple one-on-one -on -one duel. Sapphiro understood that using puppets in this kind of battle was to test their skills as commanders of the Dark Army. While they couldn't get direct help from any commander, they could request a substitute. Ike agreed to be Sapphiro's substitute without hesitation. Sapphiro gave Ike full control over her fate, choosing him as her substitute in the commander's duel because she trusted his talent as a commander and believed he would succeed. As they inspected the battlefield, Ike's messenger noticed he was quiet. Ike simply said he was thinking about how strange Sapphiro was, but the messenger remarked that Ike was strange too, given his odd orders like not killing without reason in battle. Ike ignored this and went to see what kind of puppets would be used in the fight. The puppets didn't seem very strong, but Ike knew they all had the same strength to ensure a fair fight. They could only use a shield and sword as weapons, along with any creations they made, making the battle quite challenging. Back at his office, Ike started making multiple plans to find an advantage. He asked his messenger, who had brought him something to drink, how she thought they could win the battle. She couldn't answer because she had no fighting experience. Ike then asked her what she would do to win if she had to fight. But Sati kept avoiding the question because she really didn't want to fight and preferred to settle things over a cup of tea. Ike agreed with her but knew some people could only be calmed by a good fight. After asking her a third time, she finally answered that she would use a broom, though she knew it wouldn't hurt anyone since that's not her nature. Ike took her answer seriously, pointing out that a broom wasn't a bad weapon since it allowed one to confront an enemy without direct contact. He noted that every weapon had its advantages, like a sword being better than a dagger, and a spear better than a sword, with a bow being the best for long-range combat. However, he knew his opponent might have similar thoughts. This reminded Sati that her master arsenal always said crossbows were the best for long-distance attacks. Ike acknowledged their effectiveness but dismissed them because they were too common. To win this fight, he needed something unique, and he decided to create a gun. Guns could attack from hundreds of meters away without the enemy even seeing where the shot came from. The concept of a gun was completely new to Sati, who had never seen one. Ike remembered that the commander of the 7th Battalion was a powerful mage who could help create them since she had the power to make anything. When Ike went to see Sapphiro, she was enjoying the sun and told him she couldn't make guns. Ike was surprised because she always said she could create anything imaginable. Sapphiro reminded him that she wasn't an all-powerful goddess who could create things she had never seen before. Ike then gave a detailed explanation of the weapon he wanted to create, but Sapphiro was uninterested and just wanted to enjoy some water. As night fell, Bastio received secret information that his new enemy to defeat was Ike. The knight seemed unconcerned as he inspected his new sword, specially made for the upcoming battle. However, knowing it wasn't powerful enough, the mysterious soldier decided he would only use it against the 50 puppets. Back with Ike, we see that he finally accepted one of Sapphiro's invitations to have some fun, spending some time at the pool. However, Ike felt something was off. While contemplating this delicate matter, someone brought him his clothes, none other than the Dark Lady herself. This made Ike quickly kneel before her, but he realized he wasn't wearing his mask, hoping she wouldn't recognize him. When Darrowcuton asked Ike to open his bag, he began acting strangely. This angered the Dark Lady, who insisted he open the bag, revealing it was full of weapons. The young woman questioned Ike about his behavior. Knowing being discovered would be problematic, Ike tried to act like an ordinary human, claiming he wasn't who she thought he was. But this didn't make sense to the Dark Lady, as she had always known his true identity. Her grandfather had told her in his final words that Ike possessed all his knowledge and magic. This revelation confused Ike, and he asked why they hadn't eliminated him long ago. Darrowcuton revealed she had always wanted to fulfill a great personal wish, regardless of how much power she obtained. She valued the people around her more than her own strength, as they fought by her side. With no other choice, Ike listened to the young woman's dream. 
She shared that she wanted to build a world she had always longed for since childhood, a world that could only become a reality with people by her side. Darrow Kutin explained that if Ike's talents could help achieve her dream, it was reason enough to let him live despite being human. Ike respected her wish and pledged his service to Darrow Kutin. With everything clear, the Dark Lady left, leaving Sapphiro behind, looking at the artifacts she couldn't create. Now, Sapphiro only needed to create lead bullets, which were easy to make but seemed a bit large. As the bullets were perfected, it became clear how powerful the gunpowder was, able to create a massive explosion without magic. This frightened Fiorentina, one of Ike's demon assistants. However, Sapphiro soon perfected the bullet sizes and passed the task of making many bullets to Fiorentina, as Sapphiro grew tired of the meticulous work. With everything ready, it was time for the grand duel, which turned into a grand spectacle for all the demons. They were surprised not to see Sapphiro. Bastio, expecting to face Sapphiro, also wondered where she was. Quickly understanding that this might be more entertaining for everyone, he accepted Ike as his opponent. Ike noticed the puppet soldier's swords were made of Damascus steel, the strongest metal that even the toughest spears, arrows, or shields couldn't withstand. This was thanks to the help of the great Darrow Kitten, who assisted both participants, possibly to ensure the best and fairest fight. Remembering his lady's words about helping fulfill her great dream, Ike believed Darrow Kitten's assistance aimed at creating an equal match. The battle started immediately, with arrows launched on Bastio's orders. Most of Ike's puppets were able to defend themselves, but they couldn't just stay on defense. Bastio believed he had the victory until Ike's puppets began using his weapons, eliminating enemies from a distance. Soon, there were no enemy puppets left, leaving Ike as the winner. Darrow Kutin, with no other option, had to end the duel, giving the loser, Bastio, two choices, die with honor by cutting his own throat or be executed by the ruler of the demons. Bastio quickly chose a third option, ending his life beforehand, as a goblin aimed the demon ruler's sword at him. Though the arrow was stopped by the ruler, she noticed a bomb attached to its tail. With a massive explosion in the stands and an enemy army approaching, it became clear that Bastio's plan to become the new Dark Lord was starting to unfold that very day.